This video from Learn Electrics is an introduction to insulation resistance testing. This is an essential test for all electrical circuits and the ability to test correctly to trace faults easily is an expected skill that every electrician should be able to perform effortlessly with practice. Two often asked questions are why do we test for insulation resistance and how do we trace insulation faults on the electrical circuits? Let's begin by reminding ourselves what insulation resistance testing is. We will answer the question, why do we carry out insulation resistance tests? And in this video, we are just considering domestic circuits, single phase at 230 volts nominal. The principles can be easily adapted to other types of installations, and these will be featured in a later video. Why do we test? Well, sometimes we cannot see the whole route of the cables. They are hidden behind walls, under floorboards or in trunking systems. It is impossible for us to visually inspect every inch of every cable. We want to know if the cable is damaged. In this example, a nail has penetrated the insulation and may be making contact with two of the conductors inside the sheath. If this was an existing installation, the customer may have told you that the RCD or breaker has tripped. For a new installation, never before energised, this is going to be quite spectacular if we don't find the fault before the power is first switched on. We are actually testing the plastic insulation around the conductors and we want it to have a high resistance so that the current does not flow out of the plastic insulation and into neighbouring cables or metalwork. We are going to test at 500 volts DC between separated conductors. The theory says that if a fault cannot be found at 500 volts, then it won't show up at 230 volts. Readings for a good test, a pass, are in excess of 1 mega ohm of resistance, 1 million ohms. Typically, most test meters will show 199 mega ohms or 299 mega ohms, the meter maximum for new installations. Our first test will be between the phase and earth conductors. Phase or line are both acceptable names, as is earth or CPC for the circuit protective conductor. Then we will test between phase and neutral. And finally, between neutral and earth, or CPC, as we should really call it. More about the tests soon. So just a quick recap. We will test at 500 volts DC and test from phase to earth, from phase to neutral and from neutral to earth. For a pass, an individual circuit should measure above one mega ohm of resistance for any of the tests. And the whole installation should have a combined parallel resistance above 2 mega ohms. As we said, a typical new installation will give the test meter maximum 199 or 299 for example, a lot higher with some modern meters, and this is all good. Here are two images of meter readings. On the left, the cable is undamaged and the meter maximum, 199 mega ohms in this case, is shown. On the right, it is obvious that the cable is damaged. The screw has penetrated the insulation and now the phase wire has a direct short to the earth conductor. A reading of zero ohms is shown, a direct short. We can't just turn up on site and start testing though. We must prepare the installation for testing and this is where experience and practice are essential. The actual preparation is easy, but there is a lot of things to think of. With practice, you will begin to do these things automatically. Ideally, we want just the conductors left in the circuit. It is, after all, the conductor insulation that is being tested. We are testing there's no cuts or nicks, no nails through the cable, or corroded and degraded insulation. Which means that all loads must be removed from sockets. All sensitive equipment must be disconnected. A 500 volt test voltage will damage some devices. For the tests, replace USB charging sockets with standard sockets. And fire alarm panels and burglar alarms and similar should be disconnected. 
All lamps must be removed from their holders. All fluorescent and LED luminaires must be disconnected, as these contain transformers that will indicate a fault and may also be damaged by the testing. All dimmer switches should be removed and all smart switches removed too. For the duration of the tests, replace them with standard switches. This is all part of the testing setup and part of our job. As we will show you in a moment, if testing a whole property, the main switch must be off. All MCBs should be switched off so that they do not get secondary current paths. Turn all RCDs to off to prevent damage to them. SPDs, surge protective devices, are the same. They should be disconnected to prevent damage. And AFDDs, or arc fault detection devices, should also be disconnected for the same reasons. Something left in circuit, a lamp or a plugged in device, may give an indication on your meter and you must take steps to remove or isolate these items before testing. For that reason, I always begin with a 250 volt DC test to check that the circuits are empty, as I call it. If it doesn't show a meter maximum reading, in other words it shows a fail, then suspect a problem. A zero reading will show on your meter if filament lamps have been left in situ. Zero or close to zero for USB transformers and fluorescent lamps, and close to zero for electronic assemblies and power supplies. A reading of about 0.25 mega ohms is a sure sign of a neon indicator in a fused spur or FCU. Most often an immersion heater or a central heating boiler switch left in circuit. Remove or isolate this. As for lights, leave these in the on position even though they do not have a lamp in them. It should be easy to remove most loads and do involve the customer. They should know where all their lights are, where all the sockets are, and so on. If we are testing the whole installation, for example, on an initial verification or a periodic inspection, carry out safe isolation and turn off the main switch, the RCDs and the circuit breakers. Everything should be off and all the loads disconnected. And now we can look at the testing and the results to expect. It is very important, essential really, that we match up the neutral bars with the relevant RCD protected circuits. Look at this split load board. There are two RCDs here, and even though they are switched off, we must still keep each RCD and its MCBs in the same group when testing. RCD1 controls bus bar 1 and the MCBs that are on it. The return currents from those circuits come back to the neutral bar N1. And the same with cabling for RCD2, bus bar 2, and the return currents to neutral bar N2. If you get these mixed up, you could get a false pass result when in fact you have a fault. A dangerous and potentially very embarrassing situation. The insulation resistance test is nothing more than testing between all possible permutations for the three conductors, which here is three tests. In this instance, test from line to earth, line to neutral number 2, and neutral number 2 to earth. If you cannot be certain that the light switches are in the on position, then you must change the position for each luminaire and retest the circuit. This ensures that all the wiring has been tested. Be aware that with two-way switching or intermediate switching, you must operate only one switch of that circuit. Any switch, it doesn't matter but only one. We need to look at some simple maths now. This is basic Ohm's law and is easily followed. The wiring regulations tell us that the minimum permitted insulation resistance for each circuit is one mega ohm, one million ohms. But the minimum recommended insulation resistance for the whole installation is two mega ohms, two million ohms. Together, all the circuits make up a parallel resistance, and this can be calculated using this formula. We call this 1 over R equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3 plus 1 over Rn, and so on. Let's look at an example calculation. 
If we had four circuits and the resistance of them was measured as 199 mega ohms for the first three circuits and just 2 mega ohms for the fourth, does this circuit pass or fail the 2 mega ohm recommendation? At first, it appears to be okay, but let's do the maths. Remember, these will be parallel resistances. We begin by dividing 1 by each of the values. This is called the reciprocal value. 1 divided by 199 is 0.005025. And there are three of these. And 1 divided by 2 is 0 0.5 or a half. We now add these four numbers together. And this comes to 0 0.515075. That is not the answer yet. There is one more thing to do. Now we divide 1 by 0 0.515075 and out pops the answer 1.94. This is in megohms, so our parallel resistance is 1.94 megohms. This is less than 2 megohms and so the installation as a whole is a fail. Further investigation is required. Why is this last circuit so low? Is there a problem? Does it need rewiring? Questions like this. The more that you practice these calculations, the easier that it becomes. There are some permitted exceptions to testing, but please be aware that we shouldn't use a permitted exception just because we are lazy and want to shortcut the testing. If we can do the test, we should do the test. So let's have a look. Regulation 643.3.2 on page 232 of the Wiring Regulations book tells us that SPDs, AFDDs, etc. should be disconnected from the circuit before testing. In the case of an SPD, when testing at 500 volts, the device will try to limit the voltage to 250 volts, since that is the job it is intended to do, to limit voltages, and the circuit will fail. Or devices such as AFDDs may be damaged by the test, and they are not cheap to replace. If these devices cannot be disconnected, then they should be tested at 250 volts DC and not at 500 volts. Even though we've reduced the voltage, the insulation resistance result for each circuit is still 1 mega ohm minimum as before. Regulation 643.3.3, also on page 232, allows us to take precautions where electronic devices are installed. If, for instance, there are dimmer switches in the circuit, these may be damaged by the test and should ideally be replaced with the standard light switch for the duration of the test. Or it may be a burglar alarm and its position in the building and the access to it might make it difficult to remove from the circuit. In these cases, it may be more practical to link the line and neutral conductors for that circuit together and to then test with 500 volts between the two connected wires and the earth wire. Linking the line and neutral like this will effectively bond both cables to the same voltage. If both cables are bonded to 500 volts, the difference in voltage between them is zero volts. At zero volts, your electronic circuit should be safe from harm. Then the regulations go on to say, that additional precautions may be necessary. In other words, it is up to you to decide if it is safe to test like this or better to actually remove the devices from the circuit during the test. This is one method of connecting line and neutral together. Remove the line from the MCB, the neutral from the neutral bar and connect them together with a connector block. Your meter probe will make contact with the brass screw in the connector block and the other probe can go onto the earth bar. And this method of connecting line and neutral together removes the phase or line conductor from the MCB and places it into a spare hole on the appropriate neutral bar. But if a fault is detected, how do we go about tracing the fault behind all those walls and under the floorboards? If you know you have a fault and you are certain that all devices and loads are disconnected, and you know for certain that it is only the conductors that are left in the circuit, then you must trace the fault. You should always begin with visual checks, 
look for possible fault locations, some new building work for instance, leaking pipe work etc and eliminate these areas first. Then you can move on to tracing the fault electrically with your test meter. When tracing faults we do not want ring circuits to be connected as a ring, we want the two ends to be physically separated. If not separated the return leg may confuse the results of the tests. A radial circuit can stay as it is as there is no return leg to interfere with the test results. We are going to use the divide by 2 method. This is a proved and reliable method of finding a fault both quickly and accurately. Simply choose a halfway point on the circuit to begin the tracing. Finding halfway is sometimes guesswork if it's the first time you've seen the installation. But if you install the circuit then you should know the route of the cables. It's always a good idea to mark the two cable ends at the consumer unit with A and B and to mark each socket 1, 2, 3 etc. I usually put masking tape on the socket face and write on that. It can then be easily removed after testing. Go to the halfway point and we've chosen a socket circuit here but it could just as easily be a lighting circuit. Remove the socket face and disconnect all the conductors. Now go back to the consumer unit and carry out an insulation resistance test at point A. This will test only from point A to socket number 3. If a pass reading is obtained, a high resistance result, then the fault cannot be between A and 3, it must be between socket number 3 and point B, the other cable in the consumer unit. If the test fails, then the fault will be between point A and socket 3. Let's say that we've decided the problem is between socket 3 and point B. Remake socket 3 and carry out divide by 2 again somewhere between socket 3 and point B. In this case we've chosen socket number 4. Remove the socket face, separate the cables and test again from point A. We need to test from point A each time because we may not be absolutely definitely sure which of the two cables of socket 4 goes back to point A. By retesting at point A each time we are always working from known solid ground. And repeat this divide by 2 until you've narrowed down the problem to just one cable. Hopefully it is now easy to spot your problem. We've shown here a ring circuit but it works just as well for radial circuits, radial sockets, lighting, cookers, showers etc. It is an excellent fault tracing method. Always be consistent and test from point A in the consumer unit each time and write down your test results as you move around the circuit. I also quickly sketch the circuit to help me to understand the layout and if you write it down you don't need to remember it, just remember where you wrote it. And there we are, a simple introduction to insulation resistance testing. Insulation resistance testing will confirm that at the time of testing there were no unwanted connections, that there were no leakage paths between the conductors of a circuit. You must ensure that all unnecessary devices and appliances are removed and the testing should be carried out at 500 volts DC but a pre-test at 250 volts DC is ok. And test methodically, do not skip the tests. The tracing of faults is a necessary part of the job, the more you do it the better you become. Divide by 2 testing is a good method to learn, it can be used in so many different situations as it will quickly move you towards the fault area. We hope you enjoyed this video, practice is the key to learning and understanding with any testing. Thank you for watching this video, it is very much appreciated. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. Here are some tips on getting even more information and help out of learnelectrics.com. At your web browser enter learnelectrics.com into the search bar, select learnelectrics.com from the choices offered and the website as shown will open up for you. You now have a couple of choices. You can search for a help item or any video by entering a keyword into the search bar on the right. 
Click on Return and all the help files and videos with that word in the title will be listed for you. They will be shown with a short description and each video that is listed will have a link shown that will take you directly to that exact YouTube video. Or you can browse through a list of all the available items and videos. To do this, click on the LE logo on the top left of the home page and all our items and videos will be shown. There will be 10 items shown on each page and at the bottom of each page is a page selector. Page 2, page 3 and so on. And these will bring up the next 10 items or videos in the list. And don't forget that you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, so be sure not to miss the next one. Once again, thank you for watching and we hope to see you again very soon.